I was asked to give a talk from Sister Camille N. Johnson's talk in the October General Conference. Invite Christ to author your story. I must confess that this talk did not stick out to me when I listened to General Conference. So I had to print it and listen to it again. She starts out by asking about our story and gives suggestions as to why we do not let Christ be his author. Perhaps it is because we don't have the faith to accept the answer we might receive. Perhaps it is because the natural man or woman in us is resistant to turning things completely over to the Lord and trusting him entirely. Maybe this is why we chose to stick with the narrative we have written for ourselves, a comfortable version of our story, unedited by the master author. We don't want to ask a question and get an answer that doesn't fit neatly into the story we are writing for ourselves. Frankly, few of us would probably write into our story the trials that refines us. But don't we love the glorious culmination of a story we read when the protagonist overcomes the struggle? Trials are the elements of the plot that make our favorite stories compelling, timeless, faith-promoting, and worthy of telling. The beautiful struggles written into our stories are what draw us closer to the Savior and refines us, making us more like Him. Here she gives two examples from the scriptures. I am going to use two of my favorite people. Mary Fielding Smith was born in 1801. Her Methodist family lived in England. Her brother Joseph and sister Mercy moved to Canada, and as an adult, Mary soon followed. Here they met Polly P. Pratt and John Taylor and became baptized into the church. A year later, they joined the saints in Kirtland, Ohio. Her sister Mercy and husband, Robert Thompson, was sent on a mission, as was her brother Joseph and partner with Heber C. Kimber. He would, she would meet the prophet Joseph Smith and his brother at a Sabbath meeting. Around this time, 1837, Hiram Smith's wife, Jerusha, would die after giving birth, leaving behind five children. Hiram is heartbroken. Seeing his brother this way, Joseph inquires of the Lord what should be done. He tells Hiram that it is the will of the Lord that he should marry Mary Fielding. In December of 1837, the two were married. They would spend five challenging years together. Their first son is born while Hiram and Joseph are in Liberty Jail for six months. Mary will suffer for four months after giving birth, but is able to visit Hiram and their son Joseph Fielding is given a blessing. Due to the unrest and persecution of the saints, she moves to Quincy, Illinois, where Hiram will meet her and for a brief time, they enjoy a normal life in Nauvoo, Illinois, until Cothus Jail. June 28, 1844, Mary learns of Joseph and Hiram murder. Her daughter Martha, who was born in 1841, recalls that after that day, her mother never seemed to smile. February of 1846, President Brigham Young and the Apostles crossed the Mississippi River, headed west. September of that year, Mary and others were forced to leave Nauvoo. Her daughter Martha's remembered the day. We left our home just as it was, furniture and the fruit trees hanging full of rosy cheek peaches. We bid goodbye to the loved home that reminded us of our father everywhere we turned. I was five years old when we started from Nauvoo. We crossed over into the Mississippi in the skiff in the dusk of evening. We bid goodbye to our dear old feeble grandmother, Lucy Mack Smith. I can never forget the bitter tears she shed when she bid us goodbye for the last time in this life. 
She knew it would be the last time she would see her son's family. 1848, Heber C. Kimber sent word that Mary and her group were to travel with him. But Mary's horses and some of the oxen had been stolen, and she had to gather what wild cows and oxen she could find and head out. The Captain Cornelius Lott took one look at her supplies and said that she wasn't prepared and ordered her to return home. But Mary Fielding Smith looked the captain in the eyes and firmly declared that she was going on and she would beat him to the Salt Lake Valley and ask nothing along the way. Mary's relationship with Captain Lott would not improve. When one of Mary's oxen laid down, stiffened up and appeared to be dying, Captain Lott announced that he had known that she would prove a burden to the company. She did not answer him, but retrieved the consecrated oil from the wagon and asked Joseph Filling and James Lawson to bless the animal. They did, and the animal went on as if nothing had happened. Moments later, the other oxen fell the same way, and again Mary asked for the animal to be blessed, with the same results. Another morning in Immigration Canyon, Mary awakened to find her best oxen missing. Joseph Fielding and her son Joseph searched but could not find them. Captain Lott could not wait. He moved the group, leaving Mary behind. Mary petitioned the Lord and found the oxen in the willows. A mountain thunderstorm hit the captain train and stampeded his oxen. Mary hitched up her wagon and made it to the Salt Lake Valley, a full day ahead of Captain Lot. I call that God's wink. I tell people how much God loves his daughters, and I believe God was in that storm. He was telling Cornelius Lot, love you, but you're messing with one of my girls. Mary Fielding Smith and her party would live in Salt Lake Valley and build a homestead. She asked for nothing, helped others, and was generous with the Lord. Sister Johnson said the sublime principle of agency does, of course, allow us to write our own story. You see, Mary Fielding Smith, a refined English woman, could have lived a comfortable Methodist life, found a husband, and raised a family in the normal, comfortable way of their time. Instead, she joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and followed the prophet. It is said that the great legacy of Mary Fielding Smith is that she lived 51 years in mortality. She never could have written a script of a life like hers. Her son, Joseph F. Smith, said at her funeral, Nothing beneath the celestial kingdom can surpass my deathless love for the sweet, true, noble soul who gave me birth, my own, own mother. She was good. She was pure. She was indeed a saint, a royal daughter of God. Mary Fielding Smith said, my hope is full, and it is a gracious hope. We have been enabled to rejoice in the midst of our privation and persecution, that we were counted worthy to suffer these things, so that we may with the ancient saints who suffered in like manner inherit the same glorious reward. If it had not been for this hope, I should have sunk before this but blessed be the God and rock of my salvation. Here I am, and I'm perfectly satisfied and happy, having not the smallest desire to go one step backwards. President Nelson declared that we receive more faith by doing something that requires more faith. Why do we want the Savior to be the author and finisher of our story, says Sister Johnson? because he knows our potential perfectly. He would take us to places we never imagined ourselves. He would stretch us and refine us to be more like him. 
The things we will re achieve as we act with more faith will increase our faith in Jesus Christ. Which brings me to my next Shiro. No one is sure when she was born, but we guess it's between 1820 and 1822. She was born a slave named Araminta Ross to the parents of Harriet Green and Benjamin Ross. At the age of five or six, her slave owner sold her to the neighbors as a domestic servant. By the age of 12, she was hit in the head with a two pound weight, causing her a lifetime of headaches and fainting spells for narcolepsy. She married a free black man in 1844, but would leave him and escape to freedom after she learned she was being sold down south. But saving herself wasn't enough, and she returned several times and freed others. The $40,000 bounty on her head, captured dead or alive, did not stop this brave woman. She was never caught, and she never lost a man, woman, or child. She was probably the first black female soldier. She fought in the Union Army as a spy and a scout. As a nurse, she dispensed herbal medicine to both black and white soldiers. After the war, she raised funds to help free people find food, clothing, and shelter, and a job. She worked with the Women's Suffrage Organization. She married Nelson Davis, a Union soldier, and they adopted a daughter in 1874. Her husband would die in 1888. At the age of 90, she started the Harriet Tubman Home for the Aged. Tupman died in 1913 and was buried with military honors at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York. They say she died of poverty, but they are mistaken. She may not have had money, but she was rich in friends. Harriet Tubman said, it wasn't me. It was the Lord. I always told him, I trust you. I don't know where to go. Or what to do, but I expect you to lead me. And he always did. Like Harriet Tubman and Mary Fielding Smith, we can let God prevail. We can let him be the author and finisher of our stories. It requires putting him first, counseling with him, keeping his commandments and our covenants that we made with him. We are not perfect, but God does not focus on our imperfection. He makes our weaknesses become strength. These women chose God, and so can we. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.